Hi everyone. Good day to you, wherever you are. And I welcome you to the finest music drama channel. Sharing the love of finest literature. Just lie down on an easy chair. Throw your cares off your mind. Think of nothing but the temperature of your drink. I hope you will enjoy today's dramatization. Your comments are much appreciated. Please support the love of finest literature by subscribing and sharing the channel with friends to get updated on future releases. I will make a short introduction to A Pocket Full of Rye by Agatha Christie. Rhymes from the dark past. Then we will enjoy the drama. Perhaps Miss Marple is the epitome of iron old ladies, being capable of making it from one of the English countryside to the next without going mad from witnessing swarms of stabbings, poisonings, hangings, and accidents. In Pocket Full of Rye by Agatha Christie, Miss Marple is at it again she is called upon to bring some clarity into the sudden and yet relatively expected demise of a wealthy tycoon, Rex Fortescue. A murder by poisoning. The suspicions fall on his money-grubbing wife, with everyone believing it to be an attempt by her to claim his money. However, that theory reveals itself slightly problematic once the wife turns up dead. And for good measure, someone also decided to do the maid in. With all the fantastic stories Agatha Christie has written over the years there are bound to be a few overshadowed ones out there, and this is certainly one of them. In itself, the mystery is one of the more engaging ones in my opinion as it rapidly wipes from the table any possibly clear and predictable solutions this mystery may have had, and dumps the reader in the middle of a chaotic setting with little to grasp for help. It's a real pleasure to see how Miss Marple manages to untangle this whole mess, and let me tell you right now that even the most seasoned readers of Detective Mysteries will have trouble seeing through it all. Very few of the characters can be clearly identified as good or bad, and this kind of moral ambiguity only really serves to heighten the mystery, add intrigue to it and muddle the waters even further. Let listen to the dramatization. Sing a song of sixpence, a pocket full of rye. Four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. When the pie was opened, the birds began to sing. Wasn't that a dainty dish to set before the king? We present June Whitfield as Miss Marple and Nicky Henson as Inspector Neal in Agatha Christie's A Pocket Full of Rye. King was in his counting house, counting out his money. The Queen was in the parlour, eating bread and honey. The maid was in the garden, hanging out the clothes, when down came a dicky bird and pecked off her nose. One of the little trials of living in a backwater like St Mary Mead is that one can never hope to hang on to domestic servants for very long. Once you have taught them not to rush in with the early morning tea like a bull at a gatepost, and to clean the silver, and to answer the door with a smile, and not to forget the name of the caller, they're off in search of something more exciting. That is why for the past few years I have been taking in girls from St Faith's Orphanage. A very well-run place, though sadly short of funds, giving them the best training I can. And resigning myself to the mishaps. I didn't do it, Miss Marple. I can't think how it happened. Of course, even the St Faith girls don't stay long. Gladys Martin went off and took a job in a cafe the moment she'd got a little experience. Not that I would have expected any better. She was a pathetically stupid girl. Well, it's a gayer life, isn't it? 
That was why I was quite surprised when I heard she'd been taken on as parlour maid at Yew Tree Lodge by Mrs Fortescue. It's not so odd on your feet, but you don't get so much freedom, of course. Rex Fortescue was not a very proper sort of person, the kind of man who wears a tweed suit to the office, and there were people who said that he was little better than a crook, but he was known to be very rich. And then, two months after Gladys went to work for him, he was murdered at his office in London. Mr Fortescue's having a fit! We must get a doctor, he looks awful! I'm sure he's dying! Miss Grosvenor, his a personal, private secretary, had just taken in his tea at eleven o'clock. There were rumours that she was rather more than his secretary, but as it happened, this was not the case. Mr Fortescue had acquired a second wife who was both glamorous and expensive and fully capable of absorbing all his attention. See! What... What the hell did you put in the tea? Oh, oh. Get a doctor! But by the time the doctor arrived, it was really too late. Mr Fortescue was taken off to St Jude's Hospital, and by 12.43 he was dead. You mean you don't think he died from natural causes, Doctor? Not a dog's chance, Inspector. And what's more, just between you and me, I'd be prepared to make a bet on what the poison was. Go on, Bernsdorf. Astound me. Taxine, Inspector. Taxine. Taxine? What the hell's that? I doubt if I would have spotted it if I hadn't had a case of it only three weeks ago. A couple of little girls playing dolls' tea parties pulled berries off a yew tree and used them for the tea. Is that what it is? Yew berries? Berries or leaves. Highly poisonous. Don't think I've heard of a case before of it being used deliberately. You mean it was given to him in his tea? Oh, no. The stuff couldn't possibly have worked at first. How long would it have taken to kill him, then? I'd say about two hours. Hmm. It was probably administered to him in whatever he had for breakfast. That would be your best bet. Good hunting, Inspector. No. Sergeant? Yes, Inspector Neil. I don't think we need waste any more time here. The M.O. says whatever it was that killed him was probably taken with his breakfast. Then if it's nothing to do with this place, I'll get the lads to stand down. Yeah. Uh, there is something strange, though. Mm -hmm. I checked through the contents of Mr Fortescue's jacket, and there was one thing that was really peculiar. There was cereal in the right-hand pocket. Cereal? What do you mean, cornflakes? No, sir. It was some kind of grain. Looked like rye to me. Quite a lot of it. How very odd. Well, I'm sure there's some perfectly simple explanation. Uh, could you ask that secretary of his, um... Miss Grosvenor? Yes. Lovely pair of legs. Just at the moment, eh? I couldn't care less if they were like tree trunks. Just send her in. Yes, Inspector. Miss Grosvenor, the Inspector would like a word. Yes, of course. <clears throat> I've been trying to get hold of Mrs Fortescue again, Inspector Neal, but I can't find her. It seems she's out playing golf. Hmm. Can't be all that difficult to get a message to her. Oh, do sit down, please. Thank you, Inspector. There seems to be some uh, uncertainty about which course she is actually playing on. There are three of them in the neighbourhood. Could you give me the exact address of the house, please, and the telephone number? Baden Heath 3400. The name of the house is Yew Tree Lodge. Yew Tree Lodge? Is that really the name? Yes. What's so strange about it? Uh, nothing, nothing. There's a big yew tree in the garden. It was there before the house was built. Um, can you give me details of the members of the family? Mrs Fortescue is his second wife. She's much younger than him. They've been married for nearly two years. Any children? There are two sons and a daughter of his first marriage. Mm. The daughter, Elaine, lives at home, and so does the elder son, Percival, and his wife. Mm. He's a partner in the firm. I've been trying to get hold of him, but he's away in the north on business. When did he go away? The day before yesterday. I rang the Midland Hotel in Manchester, but he left early this morning. He was going on to Sheffield. There's a second son, you said? Yes, there is. Lancelot. Mm. But there was some kind of um, disagreement several years ago. He lives abroad. Are both the sons married? 
Yes, Mr. Percival has been married for three years. They live in a self-contained flat at Yew Tree Lodge. Have you tried to get in touch with Mrs. Percival? She's gone shopping in London for the day. And who is Lancelot... What a name. <laughs> who is Lancelot married to? Oh, she's the widow of Lord Frederick Austin. Very glamorous. You've probably seen her picture in the Tatler. No, it's not exactly part of my regular reading. If you'll bear with me a moment, I'll, I'll telephone the house. Number, please. What was the number again? Badenheath 3400. Badenheath 3400. Trying to connect you. Why do the sons have such peculiar names? I believe that the first Mrs Fortescue was a passionate admirer of Tennyson's Idols of the King. <laughs> Maiden Heath 3400. I want to speak to Mrs Fortescue or Miss Fortescue. Sorry, there aren't neither of them here. Are uh, you the butler? That's right. Uh, Mr Fortescue has been taken seriously ill. I know. They rang up to say so. But there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, Mr Val's away up north and... Mrs. Fortescue's out playing golf. Mrs. Val's gone up to London, but she'll be back for dinner. And Miss Elaine's out with her brownies. Is there no one in the house I can speak to? Well, there's Miss Ramsbottom, but she don't ever speak over the phone. Perhaps you'd better speak to Miss Dove. I'll go and get her. Oh, thank you. Who's Miss... Miss Ramsbottom? She's the sister of the first Mrs Fortescue. Quite an old lady, I believe, and distinctly odd. And Miss Dove? She's the housekeeper. A very superior sort Miss of... Miss Dove speaking. Ah, uh, I'm sorry to have to tell you, Miss Dove, that Mr Fortescue died in St Jude's Hospital a short time ago. I see. I had no idea. It, it must have been very sudden. He seemed perfectly well when he left here this morning. You saw him before he left? Oh, yes. Well, what was it, his heart? Did he suffer from heart trouble? Not that I know of, but since it was so sudden. Are you speaking from the hospital? Are you a doctor? Uh, no, Miss Dove. I'm Detective Inspector Neil of the CID, and I shall be coming down to see you as soon as possible. Detective Inspector? But why have you been called in? Oh, it's quite routine in a case of sudden death, Miss Dove. I gather it is some time since Mr Fortescue has seen a doctor. Oh, he was quite unreasonable. Mr Percival tried to make an appointment for him, but he wouldn't keep it. They've all been so worried. I see. If Mrs Fortescue returns to the house before you arrive, what do you want me to tell her? Oh, just say that in a case of sudden death, we have to make a few inquiries. Routine inquiries. I'll do that, Inspector. Thank you. So, they've been worried about him lately. Wanted him to see a doctor. You didn't tell me that, Miss Grover? There didn't seem to be any need. He never seemed to be really ill. What did he seem to be, then? Well, just odd. Peculiar in his manner. Worried about something? Oh, no. It's we who were worried. Why so? It's so difficult to say. Sometimes he was quite boisterous. But once or twice, frankly, I thought he'd been drinking. <laughs> he boasted and told the most extraordinary stories, which couldn't possibly have been true. And he started to throw his money about. He wasn't... Well, he just wasn't like himself. As though he had something on his mind? It was as though he were looking forward to something exciting. As though everyday things didn't matter anymore. A big deal that he was going to pull off? Something like that. And the oddest people came round here to see him on business. People who'd never been here before. It worried Mr Percival dreadfully. Why was that? Well, Mr Percival's always been very much in his father's confidence, you see. His father relied on him. But lately... Lately they weren't getting along so well? Well, Mr Fortescue was doing a lot of things that Mr Percival thought unwise. Mr Percival is always very careful and prudent. But suddenly his father didn't listen to him anymore and Mr Percival was very upset. Did they have a row about it? Mr Fortescue was quite beside himself. He came right out into the typist's room. What do you mean by holding back that letter to Don Levy and Holtz? I just thought that before committing ourselves, we ought to make sure making that... Making sure? Checking up, never committing yourself? That's all you're good for, isn't it? But we hardly know these I people. I know them, and that should be good enough for you. You know what you are, Percy? You're just a miserable, pettifogging little clerk. 
You've no conception of how to do business in a big way. That's not fair. I'm only trying to ensure... I shall get Lance home again. He's worth ten of you, and he's married well. He's got guts, even if he did nearly end up on a criminal charge. Oh, dear. Perhaps I shouldn't have told you that. No, don't worry, Miss Grosvenor. What's past is past. Tell me, did he ever lose his temper with you? Oh, no. But then I would never have argued with him. Did he ever make a pass at you? Well, no, I couldn't exactly say that he did. There's just one other thing. Was Mr Fortescue in the habit of carrying grain about in his pocket? You mean to feed pigeons or something? Could be. Oh, no. Nothing ever like that. Well, thank you, Miss Grosvenor. I'd better be getting down to Yew Tree Lodge. Perhaps you can tell me exactly how to find it. And what can I do for you, sir? I'm Detective Inspector Neal of the CID. Uh, you're Mr Crump, I take it. Uh, won't you come in, Inspector? Thank you. Has Mrs Fortescue come back yet? No, sir. Nor Mrs Percival Fortescue? No, sir. Uh, then I, I think I'd better see Miss Dove. Something he might have eaten for breakfast? You mean he died of food poisoning? Possibly. Oh, it seems most unlikely. Will you tell me exactly what Mr Fortescue ate and drank before leaving the house this morning? He had tea, brought to his room at eight o'clock. Breakfast was at a quarter past nine. Mr Fortescue had scrambled eggs, bacon, coffee, toast and marmalade. Who was at breakfast? Mrs Fortescue, Miss Elaine, Mrs Percival Fortescue. And did they all eat the same things? Mrs Fortescue has only coffee, orange juice and toast. Miss mm. Elaine and Mrs Percival always eat a hearty breakfast. Scrambled eggs, cold ham, possibly a cereal as well. And what did Miss Elaine and Mrs Percival have to drink? Mrs Percival always has tea. Oh, but surely, if it was a case of food poisoning... I did not say definitely that it was. You mean he was poisoned? <laughs> I've never had anything to do with a poisoning before. It's not very pleasant. Well, I didn't do it, Inspector. But I suppose everyone will say that. Tell me something of the household here. Off the record. Off the record? Very well. Let me start by saying I'm not bound by any feeling of loyalty to my employers. I work for them because it's a job that pays well. I would have thought that with your brains and education... I should have done better for myself. My dear inspector, people will pay anything to be spared tedious domestic problems. I work only for the extremely rich, I run the household efficiently, and I engage the best staff available. Including the butler? Uh, there's always that trouble with a couple. <laughs> Crump is here because of Mrs. Crump, who is one of the best cooks I've ever come across. He just about makes the grade. And what about the family? Oh, they're really all quite odious. The late Mr. Fortescue was a kind of crook that always likes to play safe. He was rude and overbearing and the most frightful bully. And Mrs. Fortescue? Well, Adele was his second wife, as I'm sure you know. He met her at Brighton. She was a, a manicurist, about 30 years younger than he was. She married him for his money, of course. And how did that go down with the family? Mr Percival and Elaine were simply livid about it. They treated her appallingly, but she took no notice. Tell me a little about Percival Fortescue. He's known as Val. He's a mealy-mouthed hypocrite. He's prim and sly and cunning. He was terrified of his father, but unlike him, he was mean about money. That's why he's been so long finding a home of his own. And his wife? Jennifer's weak and seems very stupid, but I'm not so sure... She was a hospital nurse before she married him. Nursed Percival through pneumonia to a romantic ending. What about the daughter? Oh, I can't help feeling sorry for Elaine. She's one of those great schoolgirls who never grow up. She runs guides and brownies and all that sort of thing. Any love life? There was some sort of an affair not long ago with a disgruntled schoolteacher, but her father came down on the romance like a ton of bricks. And she didn't have the guts to stand up to him? Well, she did. It was the young man who ratted. I suspect it was only the money he was interested in. Elaine is not much to write home about, poor soul. And the other son? Lancelot. I've never met him. He's attractive by all accounts and a thoroughly bad lot. Some little matter of a forged cheque in the past. He lives in East Africa. 
Well, his father threw him out. Yes, but he couldn't exactly cut him off without a shilling because he had already made him a junior partner in the company. They haven't spoken for years. All the same... Yes, Miss Duff? All the same, I shouldn't be surprised if Rex Fortescue had been planning to get him back here. What makes you think that? About a month ago, he had a terrible row with Percival. He found out something he'd been doing behind his back, and he was absolutely furious. Percival suddenly stopped being the blue-eyed boy. Ever since then, he's been quite different. Mr Fortescue? Oh, no, Percival. He's been going about looking worried to death. That's very interesting. Now, what about Miss Ramsbottom? She came here when her sister was still alive, Rex Fortescue's first wife. She has a room of her own on the second floor, does her own cooking and all that. She, she's quite a character. She was a lot older than her sister. She never cared for Mr Fortescue and she simply loathes Adele. Shouldn't Mrs Fortescue be home by now? Yes, she shouldn't be long. It strikes me as very odd that even if there are three golf clubs in the neighbourhood, no one's been able to contact her. Hmm. It would not be so odd, Inspector, if she didn't actually happen to be playing golf at all. But I was distinctly told that she was. She took her golf clubs and announced her intention of doing so. She was driving her own car, of course. And... Who was she supposed to be playing golf with? I think it possible that it might be Mr Vivian Dubois. I see. Now I think I'd better talk to the girl who served breakfast. Gladys, I'll send her in. She'll probably be scared to death. I didn't do anything, sir. I didn't really. I don't know anything about I, I, it. I, I never said you did. Now, come and sit down here. I want to know about breakfast this morning. I didn't do anything at all. Well, you laid the breakfast, didn't you? Yes, I did that. Now, can you tell me which of the family came down first? Miss Elaine, sir. She came in just as Mr Crump was bringing in the coffee. Then Mrs Fortescue came down, then Mrs Percival. And Mr Fortescue? He came down last. And did you wait on them? Oh, no, sir. They waited on themselves. The tea and coffee were on the sideboard and the other dishes were on the hot plate. And everyone took coffee except for Mrs Percival? That's right, sir. She always takes tea. Tell me about Mr Fortescue's clothes, his suits. Who looks after them, brushes them and so forth? It's supposed to be one of Mr Crump's duties, but half the time he makes me do it. Have you ever found grain in the pocket of one of his suits? Grain? Rye, to be exact. There was some found in the pocket of your master's coat. Rye? In his coat pocket? Yes. Do you know how it could have got there? I couldn't say. I'm sure I never saw any. I hope I'm not interrupting, Inspector. No, no, no. We've more or less finished. You can go now, Gladys. Thank you, sir. This telegram has just arrived from Paris. I thought you should see it. Sorry your letter delayed. We'll be with you tomorrow about tea time. Shall expect roast veal for dinner. Lance. So, the prodigal son has been summoned home. Oh, that'll be Mrs Fortescue now. Adele Fortescue was glamour all through. She was what is, I believe, known as a sexy piece. Her appeal was terribly obvious, of course. It said to every man she encountered, Here I am. I am a woman. You don't mean he isn't dead? I'm afraid that is so, Mrs Fortescue. I suppose it must have been a stroke. Poor Rex. It wasn't a stroke, Mrs Fortescue. Uh, I'm sorry. Did I hear you say you were an inspector? That's right. Inspector Neal, CID. And who might you be, sir? This is Mr. Dubois. We've been playing golf together. There will have to be an inquest, I'm afraid, madam. An inquest? But why? Something wrong? I'm afraid this must all be very distressing for you, Mrs. Fortescue. But it seemed advisable to find out as soon as possible exactly what your husband had to eat and drink before leaving for his office this morning. Do you mean he might have been poisoned? It would seem that that is the case. Oh, I, I can't believe it. Oh, you mean food poisoning? But we've all been all right. All of us. Uh, I'll have to push off, Adele. Uh, you'll be all right, won't you? I mean, there's Miss Dove here and... Oh, Vivian, don't go. Well, awfully sorry, old girl. Important appointment. Uh, I'm putting up at the golf hotel, by the way, Inspector, if, uh, if you should want me for anything. Thank you, Mr Dubois. Uh, goodbye, Inspector. Goodbye, Adele. Goodbye, Vivian. <clears throat> I'm sorry we had to intrude in this way, Mrs Fortescue. 
must have been that awful bacon we get sometimes. We shall know better after the autopsy. Oh, I can't bear to talk about it anymore. It's so awful. I'm only just beginning to take it in. Oh, poor Rex. Poor dear Rex. It's been very sudden, I know. I must go and lie down. Mrs. Percival will be here soon. I'm, I'm sure she'll be able to tell you anything you want to know. <laughs> Jennifer Fortescue was a plump woman with a very discontented mouth. She had one great consolation in life, and that was shopping. Somehow it seemed to make up for all the things she believed she'd been deprived of. An attentive, loving husband, children, a house of her own. Do you mean he was murdered? Now, why should you think that, madam? Well, people are sometimes. And you're a police inspector. Have you seen her about it? What did she say? What did who say, madam? Adele, of course. I always told Val his father was crazy to go and marry a woman years younger than himself. But now look what's come of it. A nice mess we're in. Pictures in the papers. Reporters swarming round the house. What was it? Arsenic? The cause of death has yet to be established. But you already know, don't you? It seems possible that Mr Fortescue's illness resulted from something he'd eaten at breakfast. Breakfast? But I don't see... You don't see what, madam? I don't see how she could have done it then, unless she slipped something into the coffee, when Elaine and I weren't looking. But she would have had to have been very quick. I thought you might like to know that your tea is ready for you in the library, Mrs Val. Oh, thank you, Miss Dove. Yes, I could do with a cup of tea. I feel quite bowled over. I don't think she has ever heard of the word slander. Is there anything I can do for you, Inspector? I think I'd better have a word with the cook, Mrs Crump. Poor Elise, indeed. Coming in here and asking nasty questions. I'd have you know that everything I've sent up to the dining room has been just as it should be. No bad food's ever been served uh, in this house. No one is saying anything of the kind, Mrs Crump. There is just one thing I'd like you to tell me. Have you ever seen any yew berries in this house? Never touch yew berries, my old mother always used to say. Nasty, poisonous things. Is that what's supposed to have done it? We don't know yet, for sure. Well, I'd never allow anything like that in my kitchen, if that's what you're suggesting. And what's more, Excuse if you me, don't... Inspector. Hmm? Uh, but I thought you'd like to know that Miss Elaine has returned. Ah, uh, thank you, Sergeant. I'll see her at once. She's in the library, sir. Miss Dove's with her. It's so awful. I didn't think that I cared for him at all. I thought I hated him. But that isn't so. I do mind. I mind terribly. <laughs> I can see that it must have come as a terrible shock, Miss Fortescue. Do you know what the really awful thing is, Inspector? It's that his death makes everything come right. Hmm? Gerald and I can get married now. I can do everything that I've always wanted to. If only it hadn't happened this way. I don't want Daddy to be dead. I think it might be better if I took Miss Fortescue to her room, Inspector. Yes, of course. If you could just tell me where I can find Miss Ramsbottom. Her apartment is at the top of the stairs by the drawing room, Inspector. But I should warn you, you may find her a little odd. I haven't got a wireless. I beg your pardon? If it's the licence you've come about, I wouldn't let one of those things anywhere near me. It's not the wireless, Miss Ramsbottom. Well, what is it, then? I'm sorry to have to tell you that your brother-in-law, Rex Fortescue, was taken suddenly ill and died this morning. Struck down in his arrogance and sinful pride. Well, it had to come. I'm afraid this must come as something of a shock to you. I cannot say that I am unusually disturbed. He was always a sinful man. I never liked him. It seems possible that... He was poisoned. Wouldn't surprise me in the least. But I didn't poison him, if that's what you want to know. Have you any idea who might have wanted to? Plenty of people have wanted to murder Rex in their time. A very unscrupulous man. And old sins have long shadows. Have you anyone particular in mind? If you want my opinion, the butler looks to me a bit of a rascal. And that parlourmaid is definitely subnormal. I think you'd better go now. If you ask me, I'd say it was the wife. Nobody is asking you, Sergeant. But yes, I suppose it often is the wife in cases like this. Or the husband, of course. I mean, she's a very attractive woman, sir. And years younger than her husband. And she certainly had the opportunity, all right, and the motive. 
And what would be the motive, Sergeant? The money, sir. Mm. I imagine Rex Fortescue would have left her most of it. And there was that man she was supposed to be playing golf with, Mr Dubois. Do you suppose he might have been in on it too? Yeah, it's difficult to say. From what little I've seen of him, I'd say he was too fond of his own skin. A bit too careful. At this stage, though, I'm not prepared to rule anybody out. Adele Fortescue isn't the only one who had the opportunity or the motive come to that. No, sir, I suppose not. There's the daughter, Elaine, and the daughter-in-law, Mrs Percival Fortescue. The daughter was mixed up with a young man whom her father didn't want her to marry, and he definitely wasn't marrying her unless she had the money. That gives her a motive. As to the daughter-in-law, I wouldn't like to say. I don't know enough about her yet. You don't think that one of the servants might uh, No, have... Sergeant, I don't. The parlour-maid and the cook handled the breakfast, but I don't see how either of them could have made sure that it was Rex Fortescue who got the tax in and nobody else. And what about the housekeeper, sir? Miss Dove? Well, I grant you she's something of an unknown quantity. Mystery lady. But why on earth should she want to murder her employer? No, Sergeant, before we start jumping to any conclusions, I need to talk to the two brothers, Lancelot and Percival. Mr Percival Fortescue returned to his London office from his business trip to the North first thing the following morning. This has come as a terrible shock to me, Inspector Neal, as you can well imagine. He was the kind of man who seemed to have been born at the age of 45 and come into the world sitting at his desk and waiting for his secretary to take dictation. Are you telling me that my father was deliberately murdered by someone? It would seem so, yes. And have you formed any idea, any suspicion as to whom it might be? It's early days yet, Mr Fortescue. Oh, yes, I suppose it is. All the same, it would be helpful if you could give us some idea of who your father intended to leave his money to. His testamentary dispositions? Yes, sir. Well, my father made a new will on the occasion of his second marriage. A sum of £100,000 was to be left to his new wife absolutely... And 50,000 to my sister Elaine. I am his residuary legatee. I am already, of course, a partner in the firm. There was no bequest to your brother, Lancelot? No. There was an estrangement of long standing between my father and my brother. And are they still estranged? That is so. Then perhaps you will tell me what this means. Miss Dove received it yesterday. But we'll be with you tomorrow about tea time. Shall expect roast veal. Well, I can't understand it. I really can't. Seems clear enough, Mr Fortescue. Your brother is arriving back in England today. But that's just not possible. I can't understand it. Your father said nothing about it? He certainly did not. It, it's unforgivable to go behind my back and send for him. You've no idea why he would do such a thing? Well, of course I haven't. But he's all on a par with his behaviour recently. He's out of his mind. He... You must forgive me, Inspector. For a moment, I'd forgotten that he was dead. Well, if you'll excuse me, Mr Fortescue, I'd better be on my way. I want to be at the airport when your brother's plane gets in. In a way, I'm dreading the whole idea. City life just isn't my style. Up on the 908, back on the 515. I'm far more at home among the down and outs. Got to settle down sometime, my darling. Well, since the old boy seems to have had a change of heart, I'd be a fool not to take advantage of it. <laughs> Fancy Percival. All people blotting his copybook. Mind you, he always was a sly one. I don't think I'm going to like your brother much. Percy and I never got on. That's all there is to it. And yet, you know, I've always wondered whether it wasn't Percy who... who... Well, go on. Was he behind that cheque business? That time when the old man kicked me out because he was convinced I'd forged a cheque. Was it Percy who set it all up? So that you'd be chucked out of the firm? Well, I wouldn't put it past him. I wonder what he'll say when he discovers that the prodigal son is about to be welcomed home. Lance, the paper that man's reading there. Do you see? Mystery death of high-flying financier. Doesn't it say Rex Fortescue? Good Lord, I think you're right. I say, terribly sorry, but please, could I possibly have a look at your paper? Yes, Mr Fortescue, taxin. Probably from you, Berries. The whole thing's like some wild melodrama. You've no idea at all who might have poisoned your father? Good Lord, no. I expect the old man made a lot of enemies in business. Lots of people who'd like to skin him alive. 
but I'd scarcely be in and out. My husband has been living abroad for quite a few years, Inspector. It's only quite recently that we decided to come back to England. That's really what I wanted to talk to you about, what made you decide. I believe that you were not on the best of terms with your father. Oh, nobody could have been more surprised than I was. It was about six months ago. Not I... long after we were married. My father wrote and said that he wanted to let bygones be bygones. Asked me to come back and talk things over. Offered to pay my fare. Not the kind of thing I could afford to refuse. And what happened? I came over about three months ago. He asked me to come back into the firm. Made me a very advantageous offer. Which we decided to accept. I must admit I wasn't happy about leaving Africa. But I knew that Lance really wanted to come home. So, I returned to Africa to wind up my affairs there. And now here we are, back in England. Ironic, isn't it? And did your brother Percival know anything of this? Well, I don't think he had the least notion. It was all very hush-hush. My father and I met in an hotel outside London. Did any of the family know? No, none of them. Except my stepmother, of course. She was there. The old boy certainly knew how to pick them. She must be at least 30 years younger than him. Some people might consider it taking rather a risk to marry a woman so much younger. Is my dear brother responsible for putting that idea into your head, Inspector? Is my stepmother the top suspect? It's early days to have any definite ideas about anything, Mr Fortescue. Now, may I ask what your plans are? Where's the family? All down at Yew Tree Lodge? Yes. Oh, I suppose I should go down there straight away. You'd better stay in a hotel, Pat. No, Lance. I'd much rather come with you. No, my darling, I'd much rather not. But why? Well, frankly, Pat, I'm not too sure about what kind of welcome I'm going to get. I'd like to test the temperature before I bring you down there. And I don't want to take any risks on a house where there's a killer at large. May I speak to Mrs. Fortescue, please? Who shall I say it is? Mr. Dubois. I don't quite know what the correct term is for a man like Mr. Dubois nowadays. In my day, he would have been described as a gigolo. Whatever he was, he was not a gentleman. Is that you, Adele? Vivian, thank God you phoned. Oh, my darling, it's been so awful. Don't call me darling over the phone. It isn't safe. But darling... And listen, don't telephone and don't write. But Vivian... The letters I wrote you... You did burn them, as you promised. I... I will burn them, darling. Of course I will. You must burn them now. Straight away. Promise me. I... I promise. Oh, I'd better ring off now. Remember, don't phone and don't write. But, darling... I'll give you a ring again as soon as I can. Oh, darling, I... Was that the telephone I heard just now, Gladys? Who was it? Oh, that was just a wrong number, Miss Dove. Mm. Someone thought we were the laundry. Mm. And before that, it was Mr. Dupois. He wanted to speak to the mistress. Well, You'd better take in the tea. It should have been there ages ago. Quick as you can. Yes, Miss Dove. Oh, Miss Dove. Thank goodness someone's still alive in this place. And what's happened to tea? We've only got the teapot. Where are the cakes and things? I'll see to it, Mrs. Fortescue. Where everybody this afternoon? I really do not know. <laughs> Miss Fortescue came in a little time ago. I think Mrs. Percival's writing letters in her room. Oh, that woman never stops writing letters. She takes a positive delight in death and disaster. It's utterly ghoulish. Whatever's happened to tea? There's a tray standing in the hall with cakes and things on it. What's it doing there? I'll see to it at once, Oh, Miss speed it up, please, Miss Dove. I'm starving. Hello, Mrs. Val. I didn't know you had been out. I went into the garden for a breath of air. Help me off with my coat, will you? It's so cold. I should be glad to get to the fire. What are the tea things doing there? Oh, Gladys seems to have gone off somewhere. I'll take the tray in now. <laughs> Give it to me. You see to the door. Thank you. That's very kind. I suppose it is an emergency. Hello. You must be Mr. Lancelot Fortescue. The very same. Where's your luggage? Uh, this is all there is. I've paid off the taxi. And is your wife with you? She won't be coming. At least, not yet. Then come this way, won't you, Mr. Fortescue? Everyone's in the library. Thank you. Lance? Oh, Lance! <laughs> oh, <laughs> is it really you? Darling. 
<laughs> well, I'd hate to think of you throwing your arms around a perfectly strange man, oh. little sister. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, and you must be Jennifer, Val's wife. I'm afraid that Percival's been detained in town. He has to see to everything. You can really have no idea what we're going through. It must be terrible for you. Oh, but what can I be thinking of? You haven't met Adele. Adele, my dear, this oh, is... Oh, but I have. How are you, stepmother? But surely you can't have. Sit down on the sofa beside me, Lance. Let me pour you a cup of tea. Mm. I'm so glad you've come, Lance. We badly need a man about the house. You must let me do everything I can to help. It's been so awful. We've had the police here. I know. They met me at the airport. What did they say? Did they tell you that they think he was poisoned? And they seem to think that it might have been one of us. Well, that's their problem. Now, let's get down to this delicious tea. It's a long time since I've seen anything like this. Mm. Mm. Is, uh, is Aunt Effie still with us? Oh, she's alive, all right. But she won't come down and have meals. She's very peculiar. She was always that. I must go and see her after tea. At her age, one does really feel that she ought to be in some kind of home. Heaven help any old lady's home that got Aunt Effie in their midst. <laughs> <laughs> this is delicious. Can I tempt you to a piece of chocolate cake, Lance? Oh, most certainly. You'll find that I'm very easily tempted, stepmother. I don't know where the girl's gone. Went off without a word to me. And she knew it was Crump's day off. How we're going to manage now, I don't know. We shall cope somehow, Mrs Crump. And if Gladys isn't back in time, I shall wait at table myself. She won't come back. She was wearing her best nylon stockings. She's got a young man, you know, Miss Dove, though you wouldn't think it to look at her. <laughs> Albert, his name is. Going to get married next year, or so she'd have you believe. Mm. <laughs> but what about the tea things? They're still laying in the library. Who's going to clear them away? That's what I'd like to know. I'll see to it, Mrs Crump. I'll go and do it now. Oh, Mrs Fortescue, I didn't realise you were in here all by yourself. Shall I turn the light on? Mrs. Fortescue, what's the matter? Oh, my God. Well, Doctor, what was it? Cyanide. Potassium cyanide, probably, in the tea. Cyanide? And she was top of my list of suspects. Well, you'll have to think again, won't you? Who was the last person to leave the library? Miss Elaine Fortescue. She said her stepmother was perfectly well when she left, pouring herself another cup of tea. Her last, I should imagine. I'm sorry to disturb you, sir. Yes, Sergeant, what is it? We found her, sir. Found who? The parlourmaid, sir. Gladys. Well, what about her? It was the housemaid, sir. She remembered that she hadn't brought the clothes in that were hanging on the line. She went out there with a torch to get them in, and she almost fell over the body. Body? Gladys. Strangled she was with a stocking round her throat. Been dead for hours, I'd say. And, sir, somebody had done a wicked joke on her. What do you mean? A clothes peg. There was a clothes peg clipped on her nose. That was what made me so very angry. I just happened to pick up the paper, and there it was. Such a cruel, contemptuous gesture. It gave me a kind of picture of the murderer. To do a thing like that, it is so very wicked to affront human dignity like that. Particularly if you have already killed. There was only one thing to do. I caught an early train from St Mary Mead and two changes and a taxi ride later. Not an easy journey. I was standing outside Yew Tree Lodge. Yes, madam. What can I do for you? Could I see the mistress of the house, please? Well, madam, I don't know who exactly that would be. Now I have that... come to speak about the poor girl who was killed, Gladys Martin. Oh. Well, we'll see then. Uh... Well, perhaps you'd best see Mrs. Lance Fortescue. She's in the library. Thank you. I hope there wasn't anyone you specially wanted to see, Miss Marple. I wasn't here when it happened. My husband and I only came over from Africa a few days ago. It's very simple, really. I read in the paper about Gladys having been murdered, and, of course, I knew all about her. Oh! I trained the girl for domestic service. 
And since this terrible thing has happened to her, well, I felt that I ought to come and see if there were anything I could do about it. I think that it's a very good thing you have come. Nobody seems to know very much about her, relatives and all that. No, of course not. She didn't have any relatives. She came to me from the orphanage. I never even saw her. Was she a pretty girl? Oh, no, not at all. Adenoids and a good many spots. She was rather pathetically stupid, too. But that did not stop her from being very keen on men. Poor soul. It can't have been much of a life. It seems so horrible and futile that she should have been caught up in this thing. I suppose she'd seen or noticed something. But to put a clothes peg on the poor girl's nose. The whole thing is such a horrible nightmare. A pointless murder without any rhyme or reason to it. Oh, I wouldn't say that, you know. I think you'd better come and speak to Inspector Neil. He's in the house now. He's a very human person. For a policeman. And the girl actually lived in your house, then? That is why I feel responsible for her in a kind of way. But she was a very silly girl, you know. She wouldn't know what to do if something came up. Oh, dear. I'm expressing myself very badly. You mean that she didn't have good judgment as to what was important or not, is that it? Oh, yes, exactly, Inspector. When you say that she was silly... She was the credulous type. She was the sort of girl who would have given her savings to a swindler. Oh, if she'd had any savings. What about men? Oh, she wanted a young man badly. In fact, I think that is why she left St Mary Mead. The competition there is very keen. She did have hopes of the young man who delivered the fish. Young Fred Parkin had a pleasant word for all the girls. But, of course, he did not mean anything by it. That upset Gladys quite a lot. But I gather she did find herself a young man in the end. It seems so. Albert Evans, I gather his name was. She seems to have met him at some holiday camp. He was a mining engineer, or so she told the cook. That seems most unlikely. But I dare say it is what he told her. As I say, she would believe anything. You don't connect him with this business at all? No, I don't think so. He never seems to have visited her, though there were a few postcards. Oh, well, I'm glad that she had her little romance, since her life was so brutally cut short. I wonder... I suppose it would be a great presumption on my part if I could possibly assist you in my very humble and, I'm afraid, very feminine way. Assist me? Talk to people. They might say things to me that they'd never say to you. There is a Miss Ramsbottom here, I believe, who is interested in foreign missions. You may have something there. I can't say that I've had much success with the lady. Oh, it is very kind of you, Inspector. This is such a wicked murder, and the wicked should not go unpunished. <laughs> That's an unfashionable belief nowadays, Miss Marple. Not that I don't agree with you. Of course, I only know what little I've been able to read in the newspapers, but they are often so sensational, and one cannot really be certain of having just the sober facts. Uh, they're not particularly sober. To put it briefly, Mr Fortescue died in his office as a result of taxine poisoning. Taxine is obtained from the berries and leaves of yew trees. How very convenient. And Mrs Fortescue? She was taking tea in the library. Somebody slipped cyanide into her cup. Such dangerous stuff. Necessary for taking wasps, of course, but one has to be very, very careful. You're quite right. There was a packet of it in the gardener's shed. Again, most convenient. Was Mrs Fortescue eating anything? Oh, yes. Cake, I suppose? Bread and butter? Scones, perhaps? Jam? Honey? All that, of course, but the cyanide was in the tea, Miss Marble. Oh, yes, I understand that, but it is rather significant, don't you think? Hmm? And what about poor Gladys? It seems that she took the tray with the tea into the library, but when it came to the second tray, the one with the cakes and things, she got no further than the hall. She must suddenly remember that she'd left some clothes drying outside on the clothesline. While she was taking them down... Somebody slipped a stocking round her neck, and, well, that was that. And a clothes peg was clipped on her nose. Yes, a sneering, vicious, unnecessary thing to do. Surely not unnecessary, Inspector. I'm sorry? It does all make a pattern, doesn't it? I don't quite follow you, Miss Marple. No, I think there was probably a reaction against nursery rhymes when you were a little boy. 
Of course, it is a great impertinence on my part, saying this sort of thing to you. Well, say anything you like, Miss Marple. Well, I know I'm very old and rather muddle-headed, but what I mean to say is, have you gone into the question of blackbirds? Blackbirds? Sing a song of sixpence, a pocket full of rye. Oh. Four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. When the pie was opened, the birds began to sing. Wasn't that a dainty dish to set before the king? Uh, but I, I still... The king was in his counting house, counting out his money. The queen was in the parlour, eating bread and honey. The maid was in the garden, hanging out the clothes, mm. when down came a dicky bird and pecked off her nose. Good Lord! I mean, it does fit. It was rye in his pocket, wasn't it? Yes, yes, it was. There you are. And Rex means king, of course. And he was in what you might call his counting house. And Mrs Fortescue was the queen in the parlour, eating bread and honey. Yes. And so, of course, the murderer had to put a clothes peg on Gladys's nose. Mm, that is why you think I should make inquiries about blackbirds. I think it might be wise, because there must be blackbirds. Come in. I'm sorry to disturb you, sir. Uh, very well, Miss Marple. I'll look into the matter. If you'd care to take a look over the things in the girls' room, I'll arrange for it to be opened for you. Oh, that would be most kind mm. of you, Inspector. As I say, I have not the least desire to interfere. <laughs> I thought you ought to see this, sir. I found it in the shrubbery. It must have been chucked out from one of the back windows. A pot of marmalade? You mean this is the way they served it at breakfast? Yes, sir. They don't go in for fancy pots. And Mr Fortescue was the only one who ever took marmalade for breakfast. Well, that made it very simple, didn't it? Of course, we'll have to have it analysed for any traces of taxin. Where is the marmalade kept? They order the marmalade and jams in batches of six at a time. They put a new one in the pantry when the old one's getting low. Which means that it could have been tampered with days before it was brought to the breakfast table by anyone who had access to the house. Yes, sir. Did I gather that you wanted to give the old biddy the keys to the girl's room? Yes, Sergeant. She may be an interfering old busybody, but there's just a chance that she'll find something that we've missed. She's got quite a reputation at the yard. Sir Henry Clithering thinks the world of her. Well, there's no accounting for appearances, sir. Well, now I think I'll have a word with Miss Dove. I need to find out exactly when she last saw Gladys Martin alive. It was in the hall. She was mooning about as though she was waiting for someone. I told her to bring in the tea. And you yourself were coming from where? From upstairs. I, I thought I heard the telephone ringing in the hall. And Gladys had answered it, presumably? Yes, she said it was a wrong number. And that was the last you saw of her? Yes, it was. And when did Mr Lancelot Fortescue arrive? It would have been about 20 minutes later. I thought he'd arrived earlier, but... It... What made you think he'd arrived earlier? Because I thought I caught a glimpse of him through the landing window. In the garden, you mean? Yes, that's why I was surprised to see him when he rang the bell. What time did you see this man? It would have been about 20 to 5. Oh, then it couldn't possibly have been Lance Fortescue that you saw. His train was late. He couldn't have arrived here before 5 minutes to 5 at the earliest. Well, I'm sure I did see someone... Which way was it going? Along behind the yew hedge, towards the east side of the house. Where the side door is? Yes, that's right. Thank you, Miss Dove. That may be very important. By the way, you can't tell me anything about blackbirds, I suppose. What did you say? Blackbirds. <laughs> you mean that silly business last summer? Ah, hmm? oh, but surely that can't have anything to do with... I'd welcome an account of it from you, Miss Dove. <laughs> it must have been some silly joke. Mr Fortescue found four dead blackbirds in his study here. The gardener had shot them and hung them up in the fruit bushes. And somebody had cut them down and put them in Mr Fortescue's study? Yes. How did Mr Fortescue take it? Oh, he was very annoyed. Not that it ever took very much to make him annoyed. Is that what you wanted to know? For the time being. Well, then I'd better be getting on. I need to see to the guest room. Somebody coming to stay? Rather the opposite. We had prepared a room for Mr Gerald Wright, a friend of Miss Elaine's. He arrived at the Golf Hotel here the day after Mr Fortescue's death. The day after? Miss Elaine wanted him to come and stay here, but in view of the other two tragedies, it seemed more suitable that he should stay where he was. At the Golf Hotel? I think perhaps I should have a word with Miss Elaine. He's a schoolmaster. 
We're not actually engaged. Didn't seem quite the right time. What was your father's attitude towards Mr. Wright? He didn't understand him. He wouldn't allow him in the house. Gerald's an intellectual, you see. He's got a lot of unconventional and progressive ideas. I understand. Now, on the day of Mrs. Fortescue's death, you were the last person to see her alive, I believe. Yes, I suppose I was. And when was that? About twenty past five. I went out for a short walk. To the Gulf Hotel? Yes, that's right. But Gerald wasn't there. I see. Just one more thing. Do you know whether Mrs. Fortescue made a will? I've no idea. I suppose so. People usually do. Well, it doesn't necessarily follow. Have you made one? No, I haven't. Up to now, I haven't had anything to leave. And now you've got fifty thousand pounds. Changes a lot of things, Miss Fortescue. Oh, yes, Inspector. Adele certainly made a will. She told me so. And when would this have been, Mrs. Percival? Not more than a month ago. I happened to be in the High Street when I saw her coming out of Ansel and Worrell's. The local solicitors? She told me that she wouldn't go to Rex's solicitors in London. My will's my own business, Jennifer, she said. I'll make it my own way and no one's going to know about it. That's very helpful. There's just one other thing. What can you tell me about blackbirds? Blackbirds? What kind of blackbirds? I think they were meant to carry some kind of message. Oh, I suppose you mean the ones last summer in the pie? Pie? <laughs> it was all a very silly practical joke. I can't imagine who's been telling you about it. There was a veal and ham pie left out for supper on Sunday night. Somebody got hold of it, took off the crust and put dead blackbirds in it. My father-in-law was quite shaken. He kept on asking whether any of us had noticed any strangers about the place. He was really rather frightened. I am afraid that it was quite some time before Sergeant Hay remembered that he was supposed to be letting me have a look at Gladys's room. There wasn't very much to see. Some cheap and rather pathetic finery, her makeup things, and a pot of cream for her spots. And there were three picture postcards from her young man, written in a rather illiterate hand. One of them said, Lots of nice-looking girls here, but not one that's a patch on you. Be seeing you soon, don't forget our date, and remember after that it's thumbs up and living happy ever after. Poor Gladys. No happy ever after for her, but a cruel death. And a clothes peg on her nose to fit into a nursery rhyme. Blackbirds? What kind of blackbirds? I wish I knew. You surely can't expect Lance to know much about what's been going on here, Inspector. He's been away in Africa for years. It wouldn't be something to do with the blackbird mine, by any chance? Blackbird mine? What's that? The trouble is that I really can't remember very much about it. I just have a vague idea about some shady transaction in Father's past. Somewhere out on the west coast of Africa, I think. He had a tremendous row with Aunt Effie about it. Aunt Effie? Miss Ramsbottom. Oh. My mother's sister. Why don't you have a word with her about it? Oh, do come in, Inspector. I've been having the most fascinating discussion with Miss Marple here about our missions in Sierra Leone. She's really remarkably well informed. I'll leave you to talk to Miss Ramsbottom, Inspector. Oh, there's really no need, Miss Marple. I've asked Miss Marple to come and stay here in the house. No sense in throwing her money away on that frightful golf hotel. Oh, it's very kind of you, Miss Ramsbottom, but I really think I must not intrude in a house of mourning. Mourning? Fiddlesticks. Who'll weep for wrecks in this house? Or Adele, for that matter. In any case, I want you to stay. Then I shall go and telephone the Gulf Hotel and cancel my booking. And don't let them bully you into making you feel guilty. Don't worry, I won't. Yes, Inspector? What do you want? I was wondering whether you might be able to enlighten me about the Blackbird Mine, ma'am. So you've got onto that, have you? Well... Sit down. Thank you. I can't tell you much. I'd be grateful for anything you could tell me. It's a long time ago now. Twenty or twenty-five years. There was some concession or other in East Africa. Rex went out there with a man called Mackenzie, who was his partner in the business. 
Mackenzie died of fever and Rex came home and said the concession was worthless. That's all I know. I think perhaps you know a little more than that. It's all hearsay. Mackenzie's family insisted that Rex had done something dishonest. What kind of thing? Mrs. Mackenzie was a very unbalanced woman. She came here and made out that Rex had murdered her husband. I believe she went into an asylum some time later. She had a couple of young children with her who looked scared to death. Was there anything in it, do you think? I don't think that Rex would actually have murdered Mackenzie. But it wouldn't surprise me if he'd left him there to die. If he did, well, retribution's caught up with him. Now, that's quite enough of that. Send that marble woman back. She's the only sensible woman I've met in years. Actually, having a room in Yew Tree Lodge made everything so much easier. I could sit in a corner of the drawing room with my knitting, and nobody would really be aware that I was taking any notice of them. There is a line in Alice in Wonderland which goes, They are all very unpleasant people which very accurately summed up the Fortescues. They were selfish and grasping, and utterly without moral scruple. And yet I couldn't help thinking how like they were to some of the people I had known in St Mary Mead. There was Mrs Percival, talking nineteen to the dozen for all the world like Mrs Mitchinson, the bank manager's wife, who one day said far too much. And Mr. Percival, with his pale hair and mean little mouth, just like that nasty Mr. Emmett, who came to stay for six months at Evelyn House and absconded with the money for the church restoration fund. And Elaine reminded me of that poor Miss Peabody, who used to do so badly in the Gymkhana every year, and who fell in love with the most unsuitable young curate from Woking. No. I cannot say that I warmed to the Fortescues. And yet I had the impression that they were all frightened. Frightened of what Inspector Neal might find out about them. Not that he seemed to be paying them much attention. He was far more interested in what he could learn from Adele Fortescues, a fancy man, Mr. Dubois, staying over at the Golf Hotel. A lovely woman. A really charming woman. We often played golf together. I believe you called at Yew Tree Lodge on the afternoon of her death. Oh, no. I didn't do that. I never went near the house. You were seen in the garden of Yew Tree Lodge at about half past four. Uh, well, I may have passed that way, but I never went into the house. You didn't go in through the side door and up to Mrs. Fortescue's room. You didn't try to find something in her desk? Oh, you've got those damned letters, I suppose. She swore to me that she'd burn them. You're not denying that you were... A very close friend of Mrs. Fortescue. Well, how can I, when you've got the letters? But you can't think for a moment that I ever thought of getting rid of Rex Fortescue. Did Mrs. Fortescue? Oh, but she was killed as well. Surely the person who murdered her husband must have murdered her. It might be so. But it is possible that Mrs. Fortescue killed her husband, and that after his death, she became something of a danger to somebody else, someone who might have been the motive for Rex Fortescue's murder. But that's preposterous. You can't suspect that. She made a will, you know. She left you everything she possessed. I don't want a penny of it. Not that it amounts to very much. Her furs and jewellery, that's about it. But I thought that her husband had left her every... Did you, Mr. Dubois? That's very interesting. So you did know the terms of Mr. Fortescue's will, after all. Well, what... What are you going to do about it? Nothing at all for the time being. Not today. Do you happen to know in which room Mr. Gerald Wright is staying? As it happens, Inspector, I was on the Isle of Man when Rex Fortescue was murdered. I can't say I was sorry to hear of his death. He was an out-and-out -out capitalist, and he victimized me for my political opinions. I understand that you broke off your engagement to Elaine Fortescue when her father told you that he would cut her off without a penny if she continued to see you. Oh, that's a very crude way of putting things. As a matter of fact, I was not prepared to sacrifice my political convictions for money. But... You have no objections now to marrying a wife who's just inherited £50,000? Not in the least. The money will be used for the benefit of the community. But surely you haven't come here to talk about my politics? No, Mr. Wright. I wanted to ask you about a simple matter of fact. I believe that you were in the neighbourhood of Yew Tree Lodge at the time of Mrs. Fortescue's death yesterday afternoon. And what leads you to believe that? 
You left the hotel at a quarter past four and walked down the road in the direction of the house. It seems reasonable to suppose that you were going there. I thought of it, but I considered that it would be rather a pointless thing to do. I had arranged to meet Elaine at the hotel at six o'clock. I went for a walk along a path that branches off from the road and returned to the hotel. Elaine did not keep her appointment. Quite natural under the circumstances. Then, if someone said that they looked out of a window at Utree Lodge and saw you in the garden at about 4.35... I would say that they were mistaken, Inspector. Visibility would have been bad by then. I think it would be very difficult to be sure. He's right, of course. And I can't say that I see him as a front-runner. And Vivian Dubois? It just doesn't add up. He isn't the type. Admittedly, he believed that Adele Fortescue had left him all her money, but by killing her, he was only going to draw suspicion onto himself. In any case, he would have been in for a pretty nasty shock. You mean she changed her will? No, 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 nothing like that. But there was a clause in Rex's will that said his wife could only inherit if she survived her husband by one month. So what happens to the money, sir? It goes back to the firm. Or rather, to the residuary legatee, Percival Fortescue. Funny how everything seems to lead back to him. Yes. So where do we go now? I'm going to have a word with Dr. Bernsdorf. I want to find out what, if anything, was wrong with Rex Fortescue. And there's something I want you to do for me, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Find out the address of that asylum where Mrs. Mackenzie is. Do you want to speak to her, sir? No. I think I might ask Miss Marple to have a word with her. She probably stands a better chance of getting her to talk. And there was a clothes peg on the poor girl's nose. Such a nasty thing to do. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies. And on those who hated thee. That is what made me want to get to the bottom of it. Can't you see I'm reading? There isn't much time. I thought perhaps you might be able to help me. Huh. Nothing to do with me. I don't go around putting, putting clothes pegs on servant girls' noses. But it was the blackbirds, you see. And the rhyme. Somebody put blackbirds on Rex Fortescue's desk a few weeks before he died. He was a liar. A liar and a murderer. And you see, I couldn't help thinking that these deaths might somehow be connected with the Blackbird Mine. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord. I believe that Mr. Fortescue and your husband went out to the mine together. It was my husband's mine. He found it and staked a claim to it. But he needed money to capitalize it. If I'd been wiser, if I'd known more, I'd never have let him do it. Oh, I do understand, if only we knew these things at the time. But do you think that Mr. Fortescue might somehow have been responsible for your husband's death? Somehow? Nobody knows how he died or where he died. And all anyone knows is what Rex Fortescue said. And Rex Fortescue is a liar. Of course he killed him. And the blackbirds on his desk? Can you tell me about that? They were nine and seven, and left without a father. I told them every day. I made them swear it every night. Your children? Donald and Robe. And what did you make them swear? That they'd avenge their father's death. And Donald went out to Dunkirk. He never came back. Killed in action, they said. And your daughter? Haven't got a daughter. You mean that she too is dead? Look here. Look here. In the Bible. Do you see? Her name was written here, here, but I've stuck it out. The recording angel won't find her name in my Bible. She didn't keep faith, and so I cut her out. There isn't such a person as Reuben Mackenzie any longer. Now I want you to go away. I don't want to talk to you anymore. I want to read my Bible. Good morning. Can I help you? You must be the glamorous Miss Grona. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't uh, think No, I... no, 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 we haven't met. I'm Lancelot Fortescue. Oh! We shall be seeing quite a lot of each other in future. Is my brother in? No, not yet. Then but... I'll sit in his office till he gets here. Oh, Inspector. I didn't expect to find you in here. Morning, Mr Fortescue. You've come to take up your duties, I suppose. So you've heard I've decided to come into the firm. Your brother told me, sir. Did he now? With enthusiasm? The enthusiasm was not marked. Poor Percy. I'm only trying to put the wind up him, you know. I couldn't really stand off his life. I'd stifle in a place like this. I just want to make him sweat a bit. Get a bit of my own back. Your own back? For what? Oh, yes. Old history now. There was a little matter of a cheque, I understand. Would that be what you're referring to? You do do your homework, Inspector. <laughs> yes, it was the cheque. 
I've always suspected that my brother is... Talk of the devil. Good morning, Inspector. Good morning. Hello, loves. You didn't tell me you were coming in today. I felt a zeal of work sweeping over me. Where would you like me to start? Nowhere, just at present. What can I do for you, Inspector? There's just one thing I wanted to mention. I understand that for the last months of his life, your father's general behaviour and conduct were a source of increasing anxiety to you all. He wasn't well. He wasn't himself at all. May I ask if you suspected that your father was suffering from what is familiarly known as GPI, General Paralysis of the Insane, a condition which terminates sooner or later in hopeless insanity? Yes, Inspector, that is exactly what I did fear. That is why I was so anxious for my father to submit to medical treatment. Which brings me to my second point. I understood you to say that you had no communication with your brother of any kind since he left England several years ago. Quite so. Yes, but it isn't quite so, is it? Last spring you were so worried about your father that you wrote to your brother in Africa to try and get his support for having your father medically examined and put under restraint if necessary. Well, yes, but I really don't see... And... What was your reply to his letter? I told Percy to go and boil his head and let the old man alone. <coughs> Frankly, that was one of the reasons why, when I got that letter from my father, I came over to find out for myself. I must say, there didn't seem to be much wrong with him. So I thought I'd better come home for good and see fair play. That is a monstrous suggestion. And you actually think that we should be able to work together in this company? I won't have it. Well, you can't stop it. I'm junior partner, remember? You can't get rid of me that easily. The partnership can be dissolved. You mean you'd buy me out? And what are you going to pay me with? After you've forked out £50,000 for Elaine, there won't be anything left. We'd have to divide up the holdings. I'm sure the inspector doesn't want to hear all this. Oh, don't worry. He's lapping it up. So, what are you going to fob me off with? Bogus diamonds, inaccessible rubies, oil wells that have run dry? You know very well that you can rely on me to be scrupulously fair. I wouldn't trust you an inch, Percy. You've always been a dirty, mean little skunk, and I've hated your guts ever since you forged that cheque to get me out of the way. That is out! But you're right on one thing. We couldn't work together in a million years. All I want is to get back to Africa where I'll never have to set eyes on you again. Give me father's rubbishy speculations. Some of them are bound to pay off in the end, and if you throw in the Blackbird mine, at least it will get the murdering Mackenzies off your back. You surely can't believe all that rubbish. Oh, I don't know. The inspector believes it. Don't you, inspector? Ah, Miss Marple. Your sergeant said that you wished to see me, Inspector. Oh, I do hope I haven't kept you waiting. I was in the kitchen talking to Mrs Crump about her pastry. I always think, you know, it's better to approach the subject gradually, don't you? Oh, indeed. And the way to a cook's heart, as they say, is through her pastry. While what you really wanted to talk about was Gladys Martin. Did you find it helpful? Oh, yes, I found it very helpful indeed. I really think that things are becoming very much clearer, don't you? I do and I don't. Look, Miss Marple, I want to talk to you seriously. Yes, Inspector? In a way, you and I represent opposite points of view. One might almost call them sanity and insanity. Now, what exactly do you mean by that, I wonder? Well, Miss Marple, there's a sane way of looking at this case. Rex Fortescue's murder benefited certain people, one person, I may say, in particular. The second murder benefits the same person. The third murder, one might call a murder for safety. But which do you call the third murder? Exactly. I've had a feeling ever since you put forward the nursery rhyme idea that there was something wrong. The king in his counting house, the queen in the parlour... The maid hanging out the clothes... But the deaths cannot have happened in that order. Mm. Gladys must have been murdered before Adele Fortescue, must she? Exactly. Because otherwise she would certainly have taken the second tray into the dining room. Quite so. She took in the first tray and then something happened. Something yes. lured her away into the garden. And once that had happened, I don't see the possibility of her death being long delayed. Of course, you are quite right. It never was a case of the maid was in the garden hanging up the clothes. That was all camouflage, like the clothes peg, to make sure the thing fitted in with the rhyme. Exactly. That's why I can't see eye to eye with you about this nursery rhyme business. But it fits. You must agree it fits. Oh, it fits all right. But it leads us away from the real facts. Just for the moment, I'm going to concentrate on the reasons why sane people commit murder. We'll start with... Who benefits by Rex Fortescue's death? Quite a few people, I should imagine. But one person in particular. His son, Percival. 
Now, he wasn't at Yew Tree Lodge that morning, and at first I thought that ruled him out, but I'm not so sure. Because, of course, he could have put the tax scene in the marmalade days before, and he was safe in the knowledge that his father was the only one who would ever eat it. Precisely. Now, Consolidated Investments was in a bad way. If the firm had to pay out 100000 to Rex Fortescue's widow, it would have crashed. Ah. But she died. And again, the principal gainer was Percival Fortescue. But what makes it all so difficult, Inspector, is that he could not possibly have poisoned his stepmother or strangled Gladys since he was in his office in the city at that time. In other words, Percival is out and yet everything leads to him. There are other possibilities, of course. Mr Dubois and Mr Wright. Mm. I do so agree with you, Inspector. Wherever there is a question of gain, one has to be suspicious. The great thing to avoid is having in any way a trusting mind. Always think the worst? Oh, yes, I always believe the worst. What is so sad is that one is mostly justified in doing so. Oh, I suppose it could have been Mrs Percival. She was on the spot, she could have done it. Mm -hmm. but it doesn't seem quite right somehow, and it certainly doesn't tie up with your fantastic nursery rhyme theory. Is it really so fantastic, Inspector? If your theory is correct, then it all boils down to one person, doesn't it? You told me that Mrs Mackenzie had made her children swear to avenge their father's death. Yes. Well, Donald was killed fighting at Dunkirk. But Ruby Mackenzie is still alive, and if, as I suspect, she's living in this house in disguise, then there is only one person that it can be. I wouldn't be as certain as all that. No, oh, yes. Only one person. And what brings you here, Inspector? I wanted to talk to you about a couple of curious features in this case. And what are they? To begin with... There's the strange circumstance of the rye found in Rex Fortescue's pocket. I agree, it is very curious, but I really cannot think of any explanation. And then there are the blackbirds on Mr Fortescue's desk and in the veal and ham pie. You were here at the time of both these occurrences, I think. Yes, I was. It seems such a purposeless, spiteful thing to do. Perhaps not entirely purposeless. What do you know, Miss Dove, about the blackbird mine? I don't think I've ever heard of it, Inspector. Tell me, is Miss Dove really your name? What an extraordinary question. Are you suggesting that it is not? That is exactly what I'm suggesting. I believe that your name is Ruby Mackenzie. And what do you expect me to say to that? Do you want to see my birth certificate? That might be helpful or it might not. You could be in the possession of a birth certificate of a Miss Dove, a friend, perhaps, or someone who'd die. It really is quite a dilemma for you, isn't it, Inspector? Do you deny categorically that you are Ruby Mackenzie? I shouldn't really like to deny anything. It's up to you to prove that I'm this Ruby Mackenzie, whoever she is. Prove it if you can, Inspector. The old tabby's looking for you, sir. Do you mean Miss Marple? Yes, sir. But I was talking to her not half an hour ago. She says she's got something important to tell you. Oh, very well. Where is she? I believe she's in the library, sir. You see, we never really finished our little talk, did we? I was not quite ready then to put my cards on the table. I mean, I wouldn't like to make any accusations unless I was sure about it. Accusations? You mean you think you know who the murderer is? Well, I know who killed Rex Fortescue. It was the marmalade which clinched the matter, showing how, as well as who, and well within the mental capacity. Whose mental capacity? Oh, I am sorry. I'm afraid I find it difficult sometimes to make myself perfectly clear. I think it might be better if you were to start at the beginning. Yes, of course. And the beginning is Gladys. I mean, I came here because of her, and you very kindly let me look through her things. And what with that and the nylon stockings and the telephone calls and one thing and another, it all came out perfectly clear. Uh, I mean about Mr Fortescue and the taxine. You have a theory as to who put the taxine into the jar of marmalade? Oh, it is not a theory, I know. You know? It was Gladys, of course. <laughs> Are you telling me that Gladys Martin deliberately murdered Rex Fortescue? Oh, of course she didn't mean to murder him, but that is what it amounts to. It was she who put the taxine in the marmalade. She did not know it was poison, of course. What did she think it was, then? I rather imagine she thought it was a truth drug. A truth drug? It is really quite instructive, the things these girls cut out of papers and keep. What kind of things? Nowadays, nobody believes any longer that a magician can wave his wand and turn you into a frog. 
that if you read in the paper that scientists can give you frog-like characteristics by injecting you with certain glands, everyone will believe it. Science has taken the place of magic. And so, having read in her paper about truth drugs, Gladys would have believed it absolutely when he told her that that was what it was. Who told her? Albert Evans. Not, of course, that that was really his name. He met her last summer at a holiday camp, and he flattered her and made love to her and spun her some story about some frightful injustice that Rex Fortescue had perpetrated and how he must be made to confess and to make restitution. But how do you know this? Well, I do not know it, but I'm almost certain about it. He persuaded her to take a post here. Not difficult, considering the dreadful shortage of domestic staff. And when the day came that they'd agreed upon, she put the drug he gave her into Rex Fortescue's marmalade and put the rye into his pocket. I don't know what he told her to account for that. But as I told you from the beginning, Gladys Martin was a very credulous girl. But what did she suppose was going to happen? Albert told her that he would be at Rex Fortescue's office that morning, by which time the truth drug would have worked and Rex would confess everything. You can imagine the poor girl's feelings when she heard that Mr Fortescue was dead. I suppose she must have thought that Albert had misjudged the dose and would have waited for him to get in touch with her. And did he? Oh, yes. By telephone. <sighs> of course. Miss Dove said there was a phone call on the day of the girl's murder. Gladys said it was the wrong number. So he was arranging to meet her. That was why she had on her best nylon stockings. But she wasn't going out. He was coming to the house. Which he did. And strangled her. Well, she had to die, poor credulous girl. And then put the clothes peg on her nose to make it fit the rhyme, the nearest he could get to the little dicky bird that pecked off her nose. The, this man calling himself Albert Evans, are you saying that he wanted revenge for the Blackbird mine business? Are you suggesting that Mrs Mackenzie's son is alive after all and didn't die at Dunkirk? Oh, no, I'm not suggesting that at all. Don't you see, Inspector, all this Blackbird business is a complete fake. It was used by somebody who'd heard about the blackbirds. The ones on the desk and in the pie? Oh, yes. They were real enough, you see. Mm. They were put there by someone who knew about the old business of the mine and who wanted to frighten Rex Fortescue. But there was no question of killing him. The real murderer saw that he could make use of it and make it look as if the deaths were following the pattern of the nursery rhyme. But he wasn't after revenge. He was after money. You mean that it was Percival Fortescue after all? No, not Percival. Lance. But, but that's just not possible. He came over here in the summer to see his father. I don't believe for a moment that his father wrote to him or sent for him. Lance was determined to arrange a reconciliation with his father and to get himself a profitable position in the family firm. His father probably sent him back to Africa with a flea in his ear. But Lance had recently got married, and the pathetic pittance he was living on was not enough for the two of them. He was genuinely in love with Pat, who is a dear, sweet girl, and he wanted to lead a respectable, settled existence. For the first time in his life. And in his terms, that meant having a lot of money. While he was in England, he heard about the blackbirds on his father's desk and in the pie, and he jumped to the conclusion that Mackenzie's daughter was in the house. Who would be an ideal scapegoat for the murder. Yes. I think he must have realised that his father's mental state was putting the whole company in danger, and that if he didn't act quickly, there would be a complete crash. So he stayed on in England and found his unwitting accomplice, poor, credulous Gladys. She would also provide him with the maid in the garden for the nursery rhyme. <laughs> You really think he planned it all in that detail? I'm certain of it. Gladys would give him the alibi he needed for the murder of his father. For at the time she was putting the tax scene in the marmalade, he would be in Paris on the last stage of his journey from Africa. But how did he carry out the actual murders of Adele and Gladys? Oh, it was child's play. He came by an earlier train than the one he said he'd caught and arrived just at the time when Gladys was in the hall with the second tray. He came to the side door and beckoned her. 
He could have killed her in a matter of moments and then come round to the front door. And while he was having tea with Adele, he found an opportunity to slip the cyanide in her cup before going off to see Miss Ramsbottom. Yes, but, but what did he stand to gain by it? Was his share in the estate really big enough to cause him to kill three people? That is exactly what I thought at first. But then I happened to read in the Times something about uranium deposits being found in Tanganyika. And I wondered whether they might have anything to do with the Blackbird Mine. So that was why he was offering to take it off his brother's hands. Mm -hmm. Of course. He was on the spot. He'd have known all about it. Yes. The mine would be worth a fortune. But how do you suppose I'm ever going to be able to prove any of this? Oh, you'll prove it. You are a very clever man, Inspector. <sighs> I've seen that from the first. There's so much that still needs explaining, though. The Ruby Mackenzie business. I was certain she was living in this house. And you were right. But you were after the wrong person. Hmm? Go and talk to Percival's wife. She came to this house as a nurse when he was suffering from a severe bout of pneumonia. I have an idea that she deliberately sought him out. Rex Fortescue practically murdered my father. We didn't shoot him or stick a knife in him, but he left him to die. My mother made me swear on the Bible that I would kill him. Of course, I would never have done that. But I did want to pay him back. And that is why you got the job as nurse to his son? At first, I had the idea that I might just allow him to die. But of course, if you're a nurse by profession, you just can't do that. Actually, it was quite a job pulling Val through. And then he asked to marry me. And I thought, well... If I can get back the money his father swindled my father out of, that's a much more sensible way to go about things. And it was you who put the blackbirds on his desk and in the pie? I wanted to give him a fright. I wanted to bring it all back to him. You surely don't think that I murdered him? No, I don't. By the way, have you been paying Miss Dove any money lately? How did you know that? A cheque for £500, if you please, Miss Dove. Payable to Mrs Percival Fortescue. The stupid bitch told you, I suppose. Blackmail is a rather serious crime, you know. It's very annoying. This job hasn't quite turned out exactly to plan. I'm sure it hasn't. We've made a few inquiries. It's a curious coincidence that in the last three places you have filled so admirably... No one's ever had a word to say against me. There have been quite major robberies shortly after you left. The thieves seem to have been remarkably well informed as to where they might lay their hands on anything of any real value. Coincidences do happen. Oh, yes, they happen, Miss Dove. But they mustn't happen too often. Now, if you'll be good enough to make out that cheque. Black Knave. Red Queen. You found out what you wanted, Miss Marple? Yes, Miss Ramsbottom. I did. I'm not asking you any questions. You're a shrewd woman. I knew that as soon as I saw you. Wickedness is wickedness and has got to be punished. I do so agree. Black knave. I'm sorry for his wife, though. So am I. And you'll be going back home now, I suppose. Back to St. Barry Mead. There is a new girl there from St. Faith's. I want to find out how she has been getting on while I have been away. I've got a herring for your supper, miss. You'll find everything very nice in the house. Regular spring cleaning, I've had. Oh, thank you, Kitty. I'm glad to be home. Your lettuce is there on the whole table, miss. And there's one as went to the house up the road by mistake. Oh. And they've been away and the house shut up for weeks, so they only found it yesterday. Said they hoped it wasn't important. Thank you, Kitty. Will that be all, miss? Uh, for the moment, thank you. <laughs> Dear Madam, you'll have seen the newspapers. It was murder, they say, but it wasn't me that did it. Not really, because I would never do anything wicked like that, and I know Albert wouldn't either. I'm telling this badly, but you see, we met in the summer, and we was going to be married. Only Bert has been swindled out of his rights by this Mr Fortescue, who's dead. Bert has this friend who works in a place where they make what you call a truth drug. Bert told me to be sure to give it to Mr Fortescue with his breakfast. 
so I put it in the marmalade, but it must have been too strong. But I know it, it wouldn't be Bert's fault. The police are here, and I haven't heard from Bert. Oh, madam, if only you could come here and help me, they'd listen to you. If you could only come here and talk to them. Yours respectfully, Gladys. P.S. I'm enclosing a snap of Bert and me, taken by one of the boys of the holiday camp. Bert doesn't know I've got it. He hates being photographed. But you can see, madam, what a nice, kind boy he is. <laughs> Poor, silly, trusting, deluded girl. And to meet with such a heartless killer... But at least he won't escape justice now. I can make sure of that. Kitty? Yes, Miss Marple? I'd like a cup of tea, please. It's been a long journey. In Agatha Christie's A Pocket Full of Rye, dramatised for radio by Michael Bakewell, Miss Marple was played by June Whitfield and Inspector Neal by Nicky Henson. Miss Dove, Kristen Millward. Gladys, Clara Mackey. Sergeant Hay, Joshua Taub. Rex Fortescue, Derek Waring. Percival, Peter Yap. Jennifer, Natasha Pine. Lance, Ian Masters. Patricia, Annabel Mullion. Elaine, Deborah Berlin. Adele, Becky Hindley. Miss Ramsbottom, Margaret Ward. Mrs. Mackenzie, Charlotte Mitchell. Miss Grosvenor, Jilly Bond. Crump, Don McCorkindale. Mrs. Crump, Margaret John. Dr. Bernsdorf, George Parsons. Vivian Dubois, Michael Tudor Barnes. Gerald Wright, Oliver Senton. Kitty, Claire Hayhoe. The play was directed by Enid Williams.